the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessing are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revive you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. But rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so prosecuted the prophets which were before you. I just read Matthew, the fifth chapter, the first first through the twelfth verse. May God add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Let us bow with Sister Christian. Oh Lord, how we thank you for this day. We thank you for life, health, and strength. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy and your loving kindness. I ask you to open our hearts as we begin to study your lesson. I ask you to bless pastor, strengthen him and keep him. Then Lord, I ask you to bless new inspiration family near and far and bless every church door that's open in your name and bless every preacher and teacher and proclaimer of your holy word. Please, Lord, continue to protect us and keep us. We thank you for everything that you have done, that you are doing, and you promised in your word. These blessings are asked in your son Jesus' name, and for his name's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so kindly. Let me say again to Brother Hawkins, I didn't see your name at first, but I'm thankful to the Lord that you're still with us. A little bit worried, boy, when you ain't around, you've been around so many times, and kind of hard when you don't be there. Thank you so kind. Now, our lesson for today, good news for all. What is the good news? The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news of all. When we read about his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and his ascension back into the heavens, and that one day we too shall be able to go to be with him. That's good news. The heart of the New Testament scriptures declared unto us in John 16 and 17, 3, 16 and 17, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. That's good news. Then Paul says, for God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's good news. The story of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, gives that to us the good news of what we can have in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this <clears throat> lesson for today, the members of election verse is just kind of an offspring, if you would, for our text. Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respect of a person, but in every nation, he that fears him and worketh righteousness is accepted of God. Today's lesson, today's lesson is an excerpt from a longer story that extends from Acts 
10, 1 through 11, 18. Now in Acts 10, 1, I might do it a little bit later on. It opens up the scripture by telling us about the Lord. And by the time we get to 18, going to fear dealing with his death, burial, and his resurrection. The length of this count, which comprises more than 6%, the uh, book of Acts reflects its significance. This turning point in history occurred after the day of Pentecost. When was Pentecost? When they were all together in one place and on one accord. The Holy Spirit came like as, like as a mighty rushing wind and set every soul on fire and they began to speak in tongue. That was the turning point. When Peter the apostle had declared the gospel message that promised unto you and to all that are all far off, even as many as our Lord shall call in 2, what, 38 and 39 and 38, he tells them that if you would accept Repent, except Jesus as your personal savior you could be saved, and he tells us in 39 what we need to do. And uh, our lesson for today, as Peter standing, if you would, before a Gentile audience, pointing, posed to share, ready to share the gospel. This was a huge step for Peter to observe Jews, Gentiles, to the observant Jew, Gentiles were unclean pagans. We might endanger, who might endanger the apostle on religious and moral purity. Any sharing of faith believed by Jews, the Gentile, would have been a clear one testifying to an unclean one. Back in chapters 10, verse 1, <clears throat> when you read of this man by the name of Cornelius, Cornelius uh, was a Gentile. In fact, about it, he was an army officer, but he was a devout man one that feared God. Not only did he just fear God, but the record is that his whole household feared God. And he did a lot of praying and he gave much alms or money to the people. And he saw the vision evidently about the ninth hour when an angel of the Lord God coming to him and saying to him, uh, blessing him for what he has done and saying to him of what he needs to do. And he tells him about this man by the name of Peter, who really was at a place that he should not have been, but God works in mysterious ways. And while he was there, Peter becomes extremely hungry and goes up on the housetop and goes into this vision and when he goes into this vision, God is preparing him for what he's going to have to go through because the Jews were that kind of people. They had certain stuff that they would and would not eat. And if you did, if you ate it, then they would consider you as not being clean. But God was getting him ready to let him know it is not that which you eat that defiles you. But it's those ideas, those things that you allow to linger in your mind that devours you. And we let down this sheep from heaven while he is on the housetop with all of the various creatures. And I got a few of my members who say what they don't eat, they don't eat certain things. Well, take your time. Let me just say to you, maybe you haven't been eating it, but it's not because God have not already cleansed it. Uh, so you you got to be kind of careful about what you say and what you do because God is 
still God and he made it all clean. But prior to that, the Jews were that kind of nation that had been forbidden to eat of certain fruits. But God, who is an all wise, knowing what is going to buy, and you cannot go to a person's house, he invites you to his house, uh, and then you go there turning up your nose at what they have on the table. You've got to learn how, even if you don't like it, is to get you a little bit and then get full in a hurry. <laughs> So you can kind of sit back. So <laughs> that's right, Stan. <laughs> but you know, you go there, though. Um, that's what people have on the table. In fact, about it, uh, when I was a little boy, I had this preacher that came to our house, and my dad was, oh, my dad would say so many things, and my mother said to daddy, and she called my dad baby all the time. I don't know what I'm going to cook, baby, because we don't have nothing but some rabbit that you killed. I made some rabbit sauce and that, et cetera. Dad said, put it on the table. He'll, he'll eat. So I was a little boy, and uh, they knew I loved rabbit and rabbit sauce, so they didn't want me to be saying that. So my mom would kind of fix the place for me. And after the preacher of eight, 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 finally he said, uh, uh, Sister Orange, what is this I've eaten? She didn't want to tell Daddy said, hell, that's rabbit. <laughs> if this is a rabbit, <laughs> bring me some more. But it all depends <laughs> upon how it's prepared as to whether or not you like it. I've had a person once had a T-bone steak and the way she started off trying to cook a T-bone steak in cold, in cold grease. Put the cold grease T-bone steak. Yeah, that's right, Stan. That's me. she Mess up a T-bone steak with cold grease and stuff. Need at least have your have grease and stuff, right? But, but she didn't do that. So this is where we are today. In verse 30, uh, verse, let, me, let me just read. Let me just read verses of 24 through 33 of this 10th chapter before we get to the 34th verse. 24. Let's back to 23. Then after after Cordesis and Cornelius men get that penetry, then called them and enlarged unto them. And on the morrow, after Peter had stayed there all night together, and Peter went away with them, and they and certain brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And tomorrow, as they had in Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called against his kinsmen and his near friend. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. And he talked with him. He went in and found many that will come together. And he said unto them, you know how that is it on local things for a man that is a Jew to keep company or coming to one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without change, and as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore, what intent you have for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, this praying man, four days ago, I was fasting until the hour, this hour. And at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the evening, then prayer in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, an angel, and said, Cornelius, thou prayer is heard, and the arms or had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Thizza, Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges in the house of one Simon of Tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto you, shall speak unto thee immediately. Therefore I sent to thee, and you as well done that you are here. Now therefore, 
or we all here present before God to hear all things, hear all things that are commanded of God. Then Peter, then Peter opened his mouth and said, I was truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of person. Peter, having evaluated the sequence of the event, Peter realized his own vision, disturbing as it was, had been a time to coincide perfectly with the vision of Cornelius. Peter therefore could draw no conclusion other than that God is no respecter of a person. That was so then, that is so now. God is no respecter of a person. Many times we feel as though that your status or your pigmentation has something to do with God, but God is no respecter of a person. God is not concerned about who you think you are. You, he's more concerned about who you know that he is. So pigmentation has nothing or as an issue has nothing to do with God. But in every nation, he that fears God and worketh righteousness is accepted with God, or with him, whomever you are. Here the word nation does not refer to a political identity, but to ethnic and religious background. People everywhere, God Almighty, who fear God and who demonstrate thy fear by obeying him are welcome. If this seemed object to us after 2,000 years of humanity, it was certainly shocking to Peter and spiritual. Imagine Peter's surprise to hear these words coming from his own mouth. This occasion marks the first time that an Israelite offered Gentiles the opportunity to become full beneficiaries of God's covenant, a new covenant. Back in Acts 15, Peter August with those, Paul had to get them straight out there, but, but Peter had said one thing, and Peter had them know in Acts 15 at the meeting that God was not concerned about nationality. God was concerned about the man's heart. If your heart is wrong, don't care nothing about pigmentation that makes you wrong. God is concerned about what's going on on the inside. These words which God Sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ is Lord of all, despite the name of his origin. Peter did not hide the fact that Jesus' ministry focused absolutely, exclusively on the cheering of Israel in Matthew 15 24. But at the same time, Peter noticed that Jesus, who was the anticipated Christ, meaning an only one of the Jews, to be the Lord of all people, not some, but all people. Now, the piece of Jesus preaching referred primarily to peace between God and the sinner. But in the context of Peter's sermon, it also included peace between divi divided people, group of Gentiles and Jews, whites and blacks and whomever. We are all one in Christ. 
God had promised Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 12 after his daddy Tehran died. And Abram made that journey. God had promised him that through him, not some, but all nations of the earth would be blessed through this man named Abram, who later on became a part of forming the Jewish trial. God had promised him that he would do that. Old Testament prophet had looked forward to the day when God would bring peace to the whole world. And Isaiah 50, 2, 7. Peter understood Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecy. Jesus is the only way to have peace, full peace with both people and God. In Romans 5, 1, he writes, but God, I please God liberate us from our first mother's womb that we might all be one. Romans 5 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. How do you get it? Through Jesus Christ, however, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We get it all through Christ Jesus, our Lord, by one. That word, I say, you know, was published throughout all Judea. It began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. In John's Gospel, chapter one, it talks about the fact when Jesus, when John baptized Jesus, straightway went up out of the water, and a voice was heard saying, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Whatever was going on prior to that, the real deal is here now you know what Jesus has to say. Say the word I say, you know, indicates a certain level of prior knowledge on the part of Peter's Gentile audience. In Acts chapter 26, I want to begin reading at verse 24 down to about 27 to try to bring this out a little bit more. Acts chapter 26. Let me read, begin reading at verse uh, 24. And as he thus spoke of himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning does make you mad. But Paul said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the word of truth and soberness. For the king, Festus, know what I'm saying. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom I also speak freely. For I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for well, this thing was not done to Korah. And King Agrippa, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost. You have persuaded me to become. Paul later on said, I wouldn't not almost all together, but I get you and understand what I'm saying. 
it is important for us to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior, not almost, but all together. Peter's Gentile audience, but there was still more to learn. So Peter framed his teaching by setting two reference points. One, the geographic, published throughout all of Judea and began from Galilee, and one chronologically after the baptism, which John preached. Another way to say this is that the gospel of Jesus became a historical reality in both place and in time. His ministry was preceded by that of John the Baptist, who did baptize, for he said, and I indeed baptized thee with water, but there was one who coming after me shall baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost and shall preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. The designation Jesus of Nazareth, often used by Jesus' enemies, was well known at this time. Regarding the Holy Ghost and power by which Jesus began his ministry in Luke 4. Jesus, 4, Jesus said in Luke 4, the Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. And he preached. Who went about doing good, Jesus did. Healing all that was oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. That was one of the things he did during his ministry. The primary purpose for Jesus' miracle, whether they dealt with physical healing or spiritual relief from oppression by the devil, was to provide evidence of his divine nature. Many people, as in that day, as in ours, sadly did not grasp with it choosing instead of focusing on the, the past and physically needed rather than in doing spiritual temper. And many who did see and connect between Jesus and his supernatural chose to identify with him the worst element of the demonic realm. Even so, Jesus had authority to bring physical and spiritual liberation because God was with him. And when God is with you, the record is all things are possible to those that believe. Verse 39 says, and we're witnesses of other people all around of all these things which he both, which he did both in the land of Jew and in Jerusalem, where they slew and hung him on a tree. Peter's pressing his point now. Peter pressed to the heart of Jesus' ministry, having witnessed it firsthand. Indeed, to be a witness was the task of which Jesus had chosen him to and the other apostles. Acts 1.8, he tells us just before he goes back home, but you shall be my witness, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and to the uttermost parts of the world. In this regard, Peter pointed a finger directly at the Jew, not the Roman, as being responsible for Jesus' death on the cross. Yet the testimony of Jesus' death does not enter there. God raised Jesus up on the third day. God ultimately vindication of Jesus was the resurrection. 
It happened on the third day after Jesus was crucified, just as he had said it would be happened. All Jesus' teaching and miracle, miraculous work led up to this point. All Jesus' teaching and miracle would have been for note had the resurrection not occurred. Matthew says, early in the morning, upon the first day of the week, while it was yet dark, thank God for the women. The women went early in the morning to check it out. And when they arrived at the grave site, they found that the door was open. And they went and told Brother Peter, and he came and peeped in. And uh, thank God for Mary hanging around. He informed them of who he really was, that he was Jesus of Nazareth. He was the one that had came again. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that conformed Jesus to being the Son of God, who was the power, or who has the power, over death. Revelation 118 says, Hallelujah, 118. Revelation 118, give me just a minute. I am he that liveth and was dead, but behold, I'm alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Jesus still is in charge. And Jesus showed himself openly. We can be certain of the resurrection because God showed the resurrected Jesus openly. Peter and others actually saw the risen Christ themselves. John talks about it, and then Paul talks about it. Not all the people, but unto witnesses, chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he was, had arose from the dead. After Jesus had died, gone back to heaven, Peter one day said to him, let's go fishing, since he was a leader, and they decided to go with him. And a stranger appeared on the, on the bank, and he waved to them and said to them in so many words, have you caught any fish? And they said, no, we told all night. They said, cash your net over on the other side, and they enclose a great company of fish. And Peter said, that's the Lord. Others didn't understand, but Peter knew that that was the Lord. And he was ashamed of himself for what he had said and what he had done. But once he got his act together, he became a mighty, mighty man for the Lord God Almighty. God had put the stamp of approval on Peter and his message by means of two vision mentioned earlier. That message was crucial to bringing Jesus to the Gentile, starting with this household. Who is this household? This household of, of, of uh, Cornelius, who is a Roman, Centurion and his household. It was important by him bringing that house together. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. We all call this great commission Matthew 28, 
Let me back up to 17, 19, 20, 17. And when they saw him, they worship him, but some doubt it. And he said unto them, verse 18 or 19, go ye therefore and teach your nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. 20, one, and lo, I'm with you always, how long? Even to the end of the world. This verse before us might be seen to specific identify elements of the methods and message so that the commission, the methods to specify or to preach and to testify the message that Jesus has been ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. What added is really a reference is that Jesus impartially in Acts 34 and 35, Acts 10, 34 and 35, he simply says to us, Peter says, I will open his mouth and say the truth. I perceive that God is no respect of person but in every nation, he that fears him and work of righteousness is accepted by him. This role of the judge makes sense. The broad scope of Jesus' lordship is viable to his perfect impartiality as judge. 43. To him, Give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive forgiveness or remission of sin. God fear us, such as Cornelius had some knowledge of the witnesses of the Old Testament people. Thus, it was appropriate for Peter to refer them here, while in another context he may not. No Pacific prophet of notice, but the Old Testament provides numerous examples of prophetic witnesses. Isaiah foresaw a day when the people would be forgiven their iniquities. Through the one to the one who was wounded for our transgression. So says 53. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of us was upon him. And we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Every one of us have turned to his own way. But God has laid upon him the results of sin of all of us. In a similar vein, Jeremiah hoped for a day when the Lord would forgive thy iniquities and remember thy sins no more. Daniel spoke of a time that would bring an end to the sin and the Lord would make reconciliation for iniquities. And speaking of Cornelius, the other God-fearing gathered people, gathered Peter emphasized that the person who feels feel such a prophet has arrived. We note this that Acts of 10 36 through 43 was a concise summary of a sermon that went on for hours. Perhaps there were many calls to answer question. Some students see these eight verses, a highly condensed version of the fourth gospel. 36, the word which God, with good which God sent forth to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he's the Lord of 42, 40, 41. 
not all the people, but unto the witnesses, chosen for the God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. 42, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. 43, to give him all, to give all prophets witness that through his message, whosoever believeth in him shall receive forgiveness of sin. I mean, Jeremiah hope for a day. Daniel is speaking of a day. And we notice in Acts 10, maybe be a concise summary of the sermon that went on for hours. Verse 44. While Peter yet speaks these words, the Holy Ghost came and fell on them all, which heard the word. On hearing Peter's message, these Gentiles might have had all types of questions. How could they be sure Jesus was the Messiah? They could have doubted their message like so many before. But before Peter could finish speaking, the Holy Ghost fell on them all, which heard the word. If any further evidence were needed, that was it. And there the circumcision, that is that group that was already new, which believe in was astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because of that of the Gentile, also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. They are the circumcised, which believe refer to those Christian presents who were the Jewish descendants. The many as came with Peter were the six in number back in, um, according to Acts 11, 12. To a man, they were the astonished as God gave, gives the Holy Ghost as Gentile. As Peter recounted later, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Those six words are a key to the importance and ratifying for such as the output. It obviously had occurred only once before, that is on the day of Pentecost, when they were all together in one place. The Holy Ghost came like as a mighty rushing wind and set every heart on fire. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnifying God. The Spirit still works with the Gentile audience in a way similar to it works on the day of Pentecost, allowing them to speak with tongues, that is, another nation. It is only by the Second instance in Acts where Luke describes speaking with tongues, which is the ability to speak in a foreign language that one has not been taught. Back in Acts 2, you see we're all folk from a whole different nation. They were able to speak and everybody understood what they were saying. This was the divine authentication of the Gentiles, including the Jewish order who had experienced an outpouring of tongues on Pentecost. Hearing this same occurred among the Gentile audience was for the stress how good God was. Verse 46 and 7. Then answered Peter and said, Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which ever see the Holy Ghost as we? For the first century church, baptism followed as a response of the gospel message and faith. Consistent with the pattern, Peter was rhetorical why the new believers should not be baptized. Having seen <clears throat> the whole Ghost at work in Cornelius and his household, 
Peter did not have to ask whether or not they believed. The presence of God's spirit made this clear. And that first Gentile entered into the fellowship of the Lord. God's plans was to spread the news of salvation through his old covenant people, the Jews. Jesus was Jewish, as was his close disciples. All people who were not Jews were locked into a singular category of Gentiles. To devout Jews, Gentile was regarded as complete outsiders unless they adhere to the law of Moses. Today's passage overturn all of this. We can now do, we can do no better than to allow the apostle to summarize this charge. Jesus Christ, having abolished in his flesh the law of commandments, containing an audience for the making of himself or twain, one new man, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. This good news is to be to all of us who will accept the Lordship of our Lord. God still does not discriminate. God saved one nation of people just as he would save another. All we've got to do is to believe, confess, and accept Jesus as our personal Savior, and he will save you and you today if you would only believe. Let us repeat the watch words. I'm persuaded by the teaching of the blessed Bible, by daily reading, meditation, and command and communion with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to live an upright Christian life, to practice his teaching in my dealing with my fellow man, to dedicate my talent, give up my time, influence, and means to teaching or spreading the Christian religion at home and abroad to win souls through personal service for Christ, to encourage and help in the enlistments of young people in Christian work, and to make my home a center of Christian light and love. To these ends, I pray to devote myself and seek divine aid and guidance daily that I may become a living witness and a bright and shining light for my Lord. The psalm writer has said, well, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, and those of you that love the Lord ought to say, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Stanley. God bless each of us. I love you. And as Sister Brooks said to me, ain't nothing you can do about it. But I still love you. And it was, thank you, Miss Joe. Thank you, Mayor Vena, Sister Carolinas. Good looking gal from Paul Hatton. Glad to see you, Brother Stanley. William Stanley. God bless us. May heaven smile upon us. If God will, we'll see you. The weekend. Oh yes, this is where to be. I yes, don't know. I don't know what the uh, sister uh, uh, Regina's sisters are going to do about the funeral services. I haven't gotten them. If you get anything on it, would you let me know what they're talking about? The young man that got mm -hmm. shot, killed the other day. I talked to Sister Faye, and she said. They were uh, working on it, so let me know. And I told them that we did not have to worry, or should not have to worry about coming to church, because I don't remember even baptizing them. So let's do graveside. 
and be done with that. All right, so if you find out with us, find out, let me know, and we'll be ready to do what has to be done. God okay. bless us. God bless us. Have a smile. Pardon me? I say I'll give her a call. All right, all right.